Thank you very much. Bangap uh, Sumida. Uh, my name is Mustafa Bismi. I come from the Paris, Autodesk Paris team. I work in the artificial intelligence software. And today, this afternoon, we are going to spend about one hour and 10 minutes talking about navigation. So before I start, just I want to ask a question. How many of you have heard of navigation before? OK, quite a few. So it will be unfamiliar for some of you. But we are going to spend some time, so you are going to learn about this software. So today's program, we are going to start with Unreal Engine 3. So we are going to see together how we integrate navigation inside Unreal Engine 3. Then I will show you some specific tips and tricks for MMO developers, in, in particular, some gameplay tools for you to develop. And I will finish today with an integration tutorial so that you know exactly what to do when you want to integrate navigation. So I'm sorry, <laughs> because there will be a lot of technical details this afternoon. So I hope you are not going to sleep. But let's keep the start right now. OK. Unreal Engine 3. How many of you have used Unreal Engine 3 before? Yeah, one, two, three. Oh, still. Good. So today, this afternoon, what I'm going to learn to teach you is how you are going to make your level designer happy and productive using Unreal Engine. Navigation provides two types of services. We provide generation so that you can automatically generate robust nav mesh data. And we provide runtime services. So runtime services include computing pathfind, of course, from A to B, and other and many, many more services. So I'm going to start with showing you how we generate nav mesh is within Unreal Engine. You know, you all know this probably. You have already done that before. So this is my Unreal Engine integration of navigation. And the first thing I need to do is to specify the Unreal world, like this. And then I can add nav mesh inside my scene. So now that I've done this, I can compute my nav mesh at quite, quite fast, and I can show it. So as you can see, now, I have a nav mesh computed on top of my scene, and this has been computed automatically and very fast. So let's, let's say that I'm a level artist, and I want to change my level. So I'm going to add more stuff, like this, or maybe add some rotations, and then regenerate. There you go, close. So now you can see that my nav mesh have changed to adapt to my new geometry. Navigation is incredibly fast. Incredibly fast. You have no idea how fast it is. And we support any type of geometry that you can build within your Unreal uh, Engine. So this is actually fairly fast. But we provide even more services. So once you have built your first nav mesh, usually the artist wants to refine where the nav mesh is going to be. So we provide two types of tools for you to do that. The first tool is what we call the seed points. So if you pay attention here, you may see that I have a nav mesh on top of my box. 
But maybe that's not what I want. Maybe no entity ever will go on the top of that box. So to clean that up, I'm going to add a seed point to my scene, like this. There. And now, you can see that seed point is on the ground. So now if I regenerate, uh, I think I lost this one. Ah, this is not mesh data, sorry. What I want is seed point. There. There you go. So now if I regenerate, as I said, build AI pass. Close. Now you can see the nav mesh on top of my box is gone. So the seed point enables me to say, I only want the nav mesh that is connected to that point. So if you have a gameplay zone, you want only nav mesh where the gameplay is. And that's very easy to do and very level designer friendly to do. But we provide more tools. So among all the other tools we provide, usually in Unreal Engine, level designers use volumes to define gameplay. So they use volumes to block blocking volumes, or they use volumes to define trigger volumes. We support exactly the same kind of IDs. And we provide two types of volumes for you to control. We provide what we call as exploration volume or the exclusion volumes. Let me show you how it works. Say, let me take my brush, like this. I'm going to change a little bit its size to make it more interesting. There and there. And maybe rotate it a bit again. There. And now I can add, for instance, an exploration volume. And if I rebuild my nav mesh, I can see that there is no nav mesh because of my seed point. So I'm just going to find out where my seed point is gone. Maybe, maybe it's gone there. Ta -ta -ta. Yes, and I'm going to clean my scene. Sorry. Seat point. Let's press. There you go. Oops. I pass. Close. And I think I lost my view. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, let me just reopen my scene. Um, ah, there you go. There. So now you can see. I have an exploration volume. This is not easy because my laptop is very slow. <laughs> now I have my exploration volume, and now the nav mesh is only inside my volume. So if I do the same thing with the exclusion volume, I remove this volume, and now add an exclusion volume. Where are you gone? Exclusion volume, and regenerate. My seed point is gone too far. Sorry. I've lost my actor again. I think I have an issue with my <laughs> mouse. <laughs> Build AI pass. Close now. View content browser. Um, mm -mm -mm. What else? Scene. Yeah, I think my. Yeah, I lost my actor, sorry. Just add it again. There you go. And if I regenerate my nav mesh now, you can see that around my exclusion volume, there is no nav mesh inside that volume. So that is actually very useful when you design your gameplay and build your game. So you can specify where you want the nav mesh to be. So you can specify where you want your entities to, div to, to pass find. So once you have nav mesh, what you want, of course, is you want entities to work around it. So let me show you an example of this. 
and save. There, I have a scene with my nav mesh. And if I open my Kismet script, it's a bit short. You know, as any Kismet script, you can use an actor factory and spawn an entity. But this time, I can say to the entity that it has to work on the nav mesh. And when this is done, I can give it orders like move there or move there. And if I play my scene, Oops, I'm going to die. Let me just fly. You can see that I have my entities inside my game that are moving using navigation. And I can show you the nav mesh directly inside the game. Or if I hide it again, I can show you the pass. Nav draw bots like this, and I can see everything that the AI has been doing. But this is not enough. Navigation provides what we call a tool to debug and connect to your game or your game server. This is what we call the Navigation Lab. So using the Navigation Lab, I can connect to the game while the game is running and see my entities inside my scene, inside my game, walking around. So if I go back to my scene, I can see my entities there, and I can see them there too. And if I drag and drop the nav mesh data that I have generated, that I've saved as a file, I can use this to leverage uh, this view this and see my scene directly inside the debugger. So now I can see what my entities have been doing directly inside the game, like this, sorry, like this, or inside my debugger. So if I open up my debugger, you can see now my scene is running at the same time. I can select an entity to see what the entity has been doing. I can rewind in time. So for instance, I can disconnect and rewind in time to see all the properties of my entities. I can check all the statistics about navigation, like how much memory or how much performance I've been consuming. I can have profiling informations that are very deep and complete from the game. I have counters that I can check everything uh, I need to know, memory usage, and so on, and so on. So the Navigation Lab, you are going to learn today that this is your best friend. <laughs> so let me go back to my Unreal Engine. So once we have been able to do that, we also provide services, advanced services, to build specific gameplay constructions. For instance, obstacles. Obstacles are always an issue because they prevent you from moving, right? And you want the entity to walk around them. So let me give you an example of how the obstacles work with navigation in Unreal. So there I have my scene like this. It's a very simple scene. Just going to make sure that the AI pass is correctly built. And I can run it. And you can see now I have physics objects that I interact. And I have entities walking around. But if I show you the nav mesh, you are going to see that the nav mesh change on the fly as the objects are moving. We have a very fast, dynamic nav mesh computation system. So that means if you, in your game, you have obstacles that moves around, we provide you with services to avoid 
the obstacles, but we also provide you with services so that when the obstacles stop, your nav mesh will automatically be updated and the entities will work around the obstacles. So if I, for instance, if I go here and fire on this, the box will start to roll and the entities are going to avoid it using dynamic avoidance. But when the box stops, you can see the nav mesh is updated automatically. And this means that the entities are able to avoid any kind of obstacles, even the most physical ones. So, and as usual, if I connect that to my debugger, like this, I launch my navigation lab, and I connect through TCP IP connection, I'm going to see inside my scene. I think it's running a little bit slow because my computer is a bit slow at that resolution. But you can see now exactly the same thing that you have inside the game. So as my game is running, my navigation lab is showing exactly the same thing. So this is actually very useful. Because if you have a bug, or if there is something inside your game that you don't understand, you can always connect to the debugger, record what's happening, save it as a file. So for instance, if I quit my session here, I can have this and replay as much as I want, or maybe save this as a clip to send to the, your AI programmer, or to send to us back in Paris, so that we can help you debug and understand why it wasn't working the way you wanted. So among the other services we provide, we provide you with a mean, for example, very classical gameplay. You have nav mesh on the floor, you have nav mesh upstairs, and you want to jump. We provide you with a way to create connection. So if I open you an example of this, like jumps, like this, we have, for instance, places where we have upstairs, downstairs, and you know uh, the ground. You can define points on different places. And then you can say, these two points, they are jumps and they are going to create an automatic connection between the nav mesh, and the jump starts here and ends there, and you can jump one way, or you can jump both ways, or you can jump only one direction, so that when I play it, I'm going to take some distance. Now I can see my entities pathfinding and following from one place to another. We provide ways for the developers to create any type of connection that you can think of, any type of uh, system of locomotion that you want to add inside your game, you can, you can do so. So if I show you another example of this kind of things, but maybe, maybe not in Unreal, just to, see you, to give you an idea of things you can build. Like maybe this, yes. Now I think, I think I have an issue of frame rate because of Unreal running at the same time. But the, co the core idea here is you can build elevators or any type of uh, constructions that you may want to, to make in your game. So maybe I'll show you, I'll show you more to you later on today. Okay, and we provide streaming services. A lot of customers are streaming data in and out because your game world is probably quite big. So you don't need the nav mesh to be completely loaded. As you load each and different section of your game, you are going to load the small nav mesh pieces for each section and we stitch 
the knife mesh together automatically. Let me just give you another example of this. So if I load this scene there and generate my path, you can see now that I have actually I have two rooms, left side, right side, and these two rooms are connected to each other through streaming. So, oops, I think I have to be careful where I start. <laughs> there. If I start here, only one room is loaded. And if I draw the nav mesh, you can see only the nav mesh for that room is loaded. And as I go and went into the trigger volumes, the second room is loaded, and the nav mesh is automatically stitched together in a very seamless way. So this uh, actually enables you to design any type of streaming system that you want. If you have very large games, or if you have interiors and exteriors, you can build the nav mesh for each of those species together, and then load them inside your game directly. The Unreal integration we provide is quite complete. So when you use Unreal Engine, you can use the Navigation Lab, and you will be able to debug all your data, because we dump all the data as files. So if I go inside my Unreal integration now, here, you can see all the files that I have generated for my nav mesh. So if I launch my editor again, there, where are you now? There. If I launch my navigation lab, I can take my data and drag and drop directly inside my scene. So for example, here's a very big level. So I can see my geometry inside the lab. This way, I'm going to. And you see now that this level is quite big, so there's very few nav mesh inside it, but actually it's inside, because this is an interior building. And if I hide my geometry, hidden, I can check if my nav mesh looks good, if it's work right. I can test, for example, I can test an A star, like I can say start here, and I can test if I can pass fine correctly <laughs> from one part of my level to another directly inside the tool. So this means that your artist can check the validity of your data even before running the game. That is actually a very powerful tool. And I think this is something quite unique in the industry. Among the other service that you have seen, you have seen the live debugging connection. The live debugging connection is a, one of the key secrets to make sure that your game works as expected. This is actually very, very powerful. And today, let's run today, I'm going to show you, to give you examples of how this is uh, very useful. But in Unreal, we provide many more features. We provide tag volumes, we provide allowed canvas types, we provide in-game debugging, as you have seen. We provide A-star log volume, so that you can design gameplays that lock some specific areas for A-star, and so on, and so on. And this integration, actually, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. <laughs> Unreal is left-handed. See? X, Y, Z. Navigation is right-handed. So that is one of the things that you need to be aware of. But we provide you with the services to automatically convert from one to another. And we don't have the same scale, because in navigation, this is like a physics engine. And we keep a scale of one equal one navigation unit, whereas by default, in Unreal Engine, one unit can be any amount you want. And by default, it's 100 Unreal Unit. So the good thing is this integration inside Unreal Engine, you can download tomorrow. It's available on the Gameware website if you want. And we provide you with all the documentation that you need to get started. So that's it for Unreal uh, for today. But let's now talk a little bit more about uh, 
MMOs and MMO type of gameplay. Let me start with some new slides for that. Why are you now? Presentation, yeah, there you go. Let's talk a little bit about MMOs. Uh, MMOs have a very specific type of games. As you know, you probably know more about MMOs than I do, actually. But navigation and kidnaps previously has been used in many, many MMOs over the years. Later on today, David, who is hidden there, <laughs> is going to give you a presentation of how they used kidnaps inside an MMO called Lord of the Rings. But you can use navigation to make an MMO. What's a good, one of the good features of navigation for MMOs is that we provide any type of data structures that you want. And you can save on the nav mesh memory because you can share that nav mesh memory between all the instances of your world. You can design your navigation server the way you want. Here's an example that has been used at BioWare. BioWare have a very interesting architecture. They have a gameplay server that connects to the game clients, and they have navigation servers that only compute Pathfind, and that's it. So game, the clients ask for Pass, gameplay server asks to navigation server, and navigation server returns the, the Pass. So this enables Bioware to actually have a very tight control of the cost of the pathfinding and to make sure that they don't spend too much time uh, doing pathfind computation because they can leverage this navigation server. You can design even more complex systems. Maybe you want the client to make pathfinding and you want to use the server for pa validation. So this type of architecture enables you to do some very reactive gameplay, like because the client press a button to compute a pass, and then it will have the result immediately, and the entity will start to move immediately, and then you can use your server to prevent cheating and to make sure that the client is not a cheater. That is actually a very smart way to, to use navigation. Another very common secret for our MMO customers is what we call NavMesh physics. So NavMesh physics enables you to actually do use navigation just as a physics engine. Let me give you an example of that. So as you have seen inside navigation, we provide you with services to perform physics. So let me just start another scene like this and hide my geometry. Hidden. Yeah. So this is my nav mesh, okay? We provide you with a lot of different queries to use in your gameplay construction. So a query is a very simple thing, like a question. For example, recast. Say, I want to start from point A, and I want to know where my collisions are. So we provide you with the kind of services that you can use for, to build your character physics. So we provide you with more. For example, you can have uh, disk cast. Like, instead of sending a ray, you can send a disk to find the collision point against the nav mesh. Or we provide you with um, disk expansion that is very useful, actually. Say you have an entity, you want to know how much space he has around him. So as you move around, you will find out how much space he has around. So if I go next to a wall, I have less and less space around me. So maybe that means that you cannot play some animations, for example. So all these tools we call queries are very simple to use, very simple uh, to call. And they enable you to build some uh, very interesting features. Like, for example, my nav mesh here is not flat as you can see. My nav mesh is, a, is, is um, you know, a slope. So if I have an entity that works on that slope, I want the entity to stay on the slope. So maybe I can add an entity here to here. Say it has to compute a pass to go from point A to point B. 
And as you can see, we use the nav mesh for the altitude. And this is actually very, very cheap. Very cheap. So that means that you can build physics to the character to stay on the slopes and to collide with the walls in a very, very cheap and efficient way. Let me give you another example of things we provide for you. Let's say I'm a gameplay programmer and I want my monsters to attack me. Okay? The monster sees a player and wants to go at the player and start to follow him. But then the player go around the corner, right? And the monster say, I don't know what to do. What do you do? Am I going to pay the cost for pathfind? Pathfinding can be quite costly, and I think this is not the right way. Actually, we provide you with a service that we call the can go chain. So with this service, you can follow another entity without paying the cost for pathfinding because you have all the information already from the previous frames. Let me give you an example of that. So this way, let's say, we provide you with many examples, as you can see. So in this example, yellow character is my player, green character is a monster that wants to follow the player. But then the player is moving faster than the monster, so the monster has to follow the entity. And as you can see, as long as he sees the entity, he goes toward the entity. But as soon as my entity, my player, has gone through a corner, I build a chain that enables the entity to follow the player without pathfinding. This is incredibly cheap, and this is incredibly efficient for, to build those kinds of gameplays. Uh, we can use that uh, in a very, uh, even in the most uh, complex situations. Like, for example, in this example now, I said to my monster, if the player is too far, compute pathfind, because I don't know. So if the player goes too far, I can compute a pathfind to this point and then use the chain. So if I went back in time, as you can see now, my character here has completed the path from, to go from here to here, and then it's using a chain to keep track of my target. It's a very cheap and very efficient way to do uh, this kind of features. But of course, we provide even more. Let's say now I have teammates, right? Players, NPCs that play with me, or you know, aesthetic entities that we want to leverage and we want them to stay around my player. So we leverage exactly the same can go system to build those kind of, of, of features. So let me give you an example now of these kind of things. Let's say teammates. Let's start with a small teammates band. OK. So as you can see now, I have a player and two teammates that follows the player very closely. But the good thing is, if there is room, the teammates are going to go on the side. And if there is no room, we want the teammates to go to follow the player back to back using the chains. And as you can see, it actually works fairly well. So this way, you can build any type of formation and still benefit from the nav mesh to have some kind of fake physics. Let me just give you another really clear example of this. If I go crazy and say I have many teammates, you can see now that even if there is some kind of lot of characters, they are still going to be able to follow the player in a very clean way. And this is dynamic. You know, this is real. This is not a video or anything. I can take my player and make, take him anywhere I want and still benefit from, from the same system. And as the players try to find rooms around the, 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 the entity, they are going to you know, struggle a little bit, but in the end, they will always be able to choose the right formation. So if I go back through the small place now, And now we can see that all the entities are going to follow each other in a pretty neat way. 
It's incredibly cheap, very, very cheap, much more cheaper than any other systems for such, uh, for such teammate formations. We provide a system that, for, instance, for example, now you can adapt your formation depending on the collision and change the shape of the, for of the formation. So that's very, very useful. Here is another MMO example that we actually did for Star Wars, something that we call the combat ring. Very common in MMOs, right? You have the player and many monsters around the player. So, but you don't want all the monsters to be in front of the player because, you know, they intersect each other. It doesn't look very good. But you want them to spread around the player in a nice way and to find good positions for the players to, to fight you. We have computed a very complex system <laughs> that I'm not going to explain today because that's a lot of kind of mathematics. But the idea is very simple. We sample around the player different positions. We make sure that there is room. And the entities pick the right position to follow the player. So let's see how it works in reality. Melee combat. Right. Now, I have my players. And he is you know, attacked by three different monsters. And when the players stop, as you can see, the three monsters have chosen different attack distance. And they are not in front of each other. So this is actually quite useful, because you may want the monsters to attack the player at different, with different animations, for example, or different distance. And the good thing is, this is using the nav mesh to perform some physics. So if I take the player in a very small place, you can see the monsters choosing dynamically different positions as long as there are some room around the player so that they will always retain some kind of sensible formation. There is no avoidance at all. This is just pure logic. And if I really go in a place where I don't have room, maybe, maybe if I go between two pillars, so now the monsters will have to wait because there is no, no space for everyone. So for example, this one, this monster now is kind of, you know, cannot really attack, but it has to wait. And if I go somewhere else, it will be able to attack again, so it will be able to follow the player and always try to choose a position where, from where they can attack in a very clean way. So that's the kind of things that are very useful. This is the system we developed for Star Wars, actually. So among all the other features that we provide, navigation supports very large-scale generation. So we can actually handle a very large world. So this is, we provide you with examples like up to 10 kilometers square, but actually, Mm, there is no real limit. The only limit is the 64 bits of your computation, CPU computation. So there is no limit to the size we can do. I can show you, for example, one of those maps. It will take maybe my laptop is not very good, so it will take maybe a little bit of time to load, like this one. Yeah. Maybe it will take a while. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> there. So now my laptop is so slow, you cannot really see it. But you can see that it's a huge world that I can you know, explore and test. So for example, if I test a pathfind with my A star, there you go. You can see that I can pass find this huge world quite far, actually. So, and this is running on my laptop, and this is highly dynamic. So, let me give you one last example, I think, of the kind of scale that we can provide you. So, we support a quite a large amount of entities. So in this example, that is only one kilometer square. I'm going to hide the geometry. It's typical MMO 
seen, you know, with, you know, uh, outdoor, indoor, village. Places like this are actually very hard. We support 3D nav mesh, right? So if you have buildings, there's no problem whatsoever. Let me just hide the geometry again so that we can see the nav mesh. And in that scene that is running, I think, quite, quite good on my laptop, we have 1,000 entities actually pathfinding and path following at the same time. So as you can see, we scale pretty big. And you can imagine that on your MMO chart server, you can do actually quite a lot. So to conclude on this presentation, just for the MMO developers, we have probably one of the fastest generation system and probably one of the most robust runtime system for MMO developers. You can really have a lot and a lot of entities inside your scene. So my time is running out right now to, for this part section. So what I offer you is we take five minute breaks and then I will show you how to integrate navigation. Thank you. <laughs>